By the start of the Civil War, racist ideologies that had been brought on by Cotton Mathers and many others had long festered in the minds of Anglo-Saxon Americans. Terms such as wild beast, uncivilized, dirty, and demons on earth were often used when referring to Africans. Men such as John Mitchell, an Irish advocate for Irish freedom, fled to America and later became a high-profile advocate for pro-slavery. While Mitchell was writing pamphlets that justified slavery and the inferiority of blacks, Frederick Douglass and Thomas Morris Chester were reporting on the inhumane conditions slaves were forced into. Fed up with the negative portrayal of blacks in the press, Douglass believed that having his own newspaper would enable him to transform the narrative of blacks in America. In 1852, Douglass gave a speech called, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? This speech approaches America's independence from England, but from the perspective of slaves. This allowed white audiences to see that while they celebrated their freedom from England, African slaves were still enslaved by their masters. As Douglas continued his fight for freedom across the US, Chester fought his fight on the Civil War battlefield. Chester never picked up a gun during the Civil War, but he did take up arms when it came to racial inequality for people of color. He went on to become the first African-American war correspondent to write for a major newspaper. In April of 1917, the US entered the First World War. Many prominent journalists reported on what was going on in Europe, but one particular journalist never received enough credit. W.E.B. Du Bois is mostly known for his work within the civil rights realm, but he was also very prominent throughout the First World War. In May of 1919, a year after the war concluded, Du Bois wrote a piece titled Returning Soldiers. This literary work exposed racial injustice in the US and urged black soldiers to continue to fight for their freedom at home. In typical fashion, Du Bois was criticized for his work and he faced backlash for inciting violence. This didn't stop Du Bois as he continued to fight for civil rights until his death in 1963. The Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor marked the beginning of America's involvement in World War II. Both white and black men enlisted in the army to fight a war abroad. However, black men still had a losing battle to fight at home. Roy Ottilie is not well known today, but in the 1940s, he was a very prominent black journalist who reported on war. During the height of the war, Ottilie reported from Europe for Liberty magazine, Pittsburgh, and later the Chicago Tribune, CBS, and the British Broadcasting Radio. On the night of August 28, 1955, 14-year-old Emmett Louis Till was kidnapped from his uncle's Mississippi home. He had been accused of flirting with a white woman in her family-owned grocery store earlier that day. He was brutally beaten, shot, then lynched by the husband and brother-in-law of the woman he allegedly whistled at. When his decomposed body was recovered from the Tallahatchie River, days later, his mother, Mamie Till, wanted the world to see what was done to her son. Simeon Booker helped define the role of Jet Magazine by covering the story and including a photo of Till's body on the cover of the latest magazine. The display of Till's mutilated body sparked outrage and news of the lynching became national news. However, Booker didn't just stop there. He was also present to cover the trial of Till's murderers. The two men were eventually deemed not guilty by an all-white jury and Booker, along with Till's mother, spoke out against this. Booker's covering of the Emmett Till case inspired black people such as Rosa Parks and many others to join the civil rights movement. As the 1960s was coming to a close, the US was on the brink of another war. Civil rights activists were protesting for equal rights as well as joining arms with others who were protesting the Vietnam War. Ed Bradley, who covered the Philadelphia race riots of the late 60s, decided he wanted to join investigative journalism. During the war, he reported on the fall of Saigon and later Cambodia. He earned the Alfred I DuPont Columbia University Award and a George Polk Award. Following his injury, CBS promoted Bradley to cover the Jimmy Carter 1976 presidential campaign. He subsequently became the first African-American White House correspondent. His 1979 reporting on Vietnamese refugees, the boat people, earned him numerous awards and led to his role at 60 Minutes in 1981. Robinson began reporting in 1959 when he was hired at WTOV in Virginia. Robinson had to read the news from behind a slide of the station's logo, and one night he removed the slide and was subsequently fired the next day. He later began reporting for WRC and DC and won six journalism awards as a result of his coverage of various civil rights events and the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. Robinson is considered to be the first black television journalist and he founded the National Association of Black Journalists in 1975. The NABJ is still thriving today with more than 4,000 members 
However, the journey through black history in the media field is far from over. Black journalists such as Stephen Dial and Sean Rabs, Don Lemon and many others are making history every day. Those who came before them have paved the road of success and they continue to pave the road for the next generation, which I am a part of. I'm Jaden Rivers with MNG Media.